May 13th, 1918. I'm either coming out of this war a big man or in a wooden kimono. I know I can fight. I know I can fly. And I ought to be able to shoot straight. If I can just learn to do all three things at once, they can't stop me. I don't want John and George to think I spent the war raising corn and cotton. I want them to know I spent the war raising hell. Goodbye, Papa, and good luck. I hope to bring honor to your name, and if I don't, I will pass out trying. Your son, McGavitt Grider. As the American volunteers departed for Europe, John McGavitt Grider began the diary in which he planned to record his experience of the war. September 20th, 1917. Aboard RMS Carmania in Halifax Harbor. Well, here I am aboard ship and three days out of New York, leaving my continent as well as my country and going out in search of adventure. Lord, how it thrills me to be here, to be a man among men and going to war greeted by cheers, whistles, and waving flags from every ship. I'm going to make two resolutions and stick to them. I'm not going to lose my temper anymore. I fight too much. I'm not going to take any unnecessary chances. I haven't lived very well, but I am determined to die well. The unit that included Springs, Grider, and Callahan, now known as the Three Musketeers, was bound for the Italian front, a destination they had chosen themselves. October 3rd. Somebody has made a mistake. All our mail is in Italy, our money is in Lira, and we've wasted two weeks studying Italian. But our orders got all screwed up and now we have to stay in England and go back to ground school all over again because they've told us everything we learned is all wrong. I'm living at Christchurch College at Oxford with Springs and Callahan. Our barracks are a million years old. I know, because it took that long to cool off to this temperature. Everyone is so damn polite over here. We have champagne with our meals at $2.10 a bottle. This is the most charming country I've ever seen. October 28th. Our instructors have all been to the front. They say the Germans have the goods in airplanes and AA guns. I guess it's the North and South all over again. Of course, no one doubts our winning out in the end, but it will be a long, hard fight. These London women are in a class by themselves. They're good sports, good looking, good dancers, well educated, act like ladies, and don't sit around worrying about their virtue all the time. Springs was 21. Callahan was 23, and Grider was 25, but Springs was clearly the leader of the group. A friend of Springs wrote to some people at St. Albans, and they invited us to their mansion for dinner. The ladies wanted to learn the latest steps, so Springs and I tried to teach them how to do them. Dear Emma, at last I have a real romance. I wish you could see the girl. She's one of the most sought after women in London. And almost every evening I strut into the Carlton or the Ritz with this wonderful vision on my arm. Her name is Billy Carlton. She is on the stage. Dear Emma, I can fly any damn thing they build over here now. I'm at last a pilot, an aviator, and an airman. I admit it myself. Now how long it will be before we head for the front, no one knows. I took a walk on the beach. The waves rolling up and making you feel like you wanted to crawl up into your mother's lap and have her hold you close and tell you it wouldn't hurt you. The moon made a wide, glorious swath out towards France, where heroes and men and wrecks are in the making. Grider and Billy Carlton wanted to get married, but Callahan and Springs persuaded them they should wait until he returned from the front. For good luck, Carlton gave Grider a doll specially made by Madame Tussauds, with Carlton's own hair. April 20th, 1918. It looks like we're going to be delayed. Shortage of planes. We decided that since our lives were in jeopardy, we ought to have our pictures taken to preserve our likenesses for posterity. We are going to get a place in town and spend our last days on this earth in peace and comfort. I went over and had a good look at the lines. It made me sick. There's a stretch of country 40 miles square that's as flat as a piece of paper. No trees, no houses, nothing. I could see flashes of the guns and see the smoke and dust where the shells burst. We hear firing 24 hours out of the day. And down on the ground it looks as if someone had drawn a lot of pencil marks in a row. That's the barbed wire. 
Further down, I saw the Huns using gas. A thin layer of brownish green stuff was drifting slowly along the ground from a trench about 300 yards long. But no men were to be seen anywhere. November 9th, 1917. Lord, I have the blues. The worried, homesick blues. It's raining and cold as blue blazes. I closed my eyes and could see the old living room at Grider with the fire blazing and good looking dressing the kids for bed. I didn't know how good it all was. I could have been if only things had been just a little different. I guess everything will be all right now because I don't really expect to go back. April 1st. Information has been received that the Germans have developed a parachute that can be used from an airplane. Springs tried to get permission from the U.S. headquarters to develop one for our planes, but they said nothing to them. The whole sky turned black. A barrage grew up in front of me like a bed of mushrooms, and I swung around just in time to avoid it. Scared? Of course I was scared. There were heavy clouds below me, and I didn't know where the lines were. My compass was spinning around so fast that I couldn't tell anything from it. Then I forgot whether the sun set in the east or the west and had to stop to figure that out. Every time Archie would get close to me, my heart would skip a beat. Dear Jopy, God, it's great. We have 19 Huns to our credit and nobody missing. It's safe as a church if you know the game, and I am learning under past masters, so don't you be worried about me. There was a bomb raid on the field last night. Springs and I went out and crawled under a boxcar on the side, and it's about as good shelter as you can get. And we got to talking about home. He said that he had to get killed because he couldn't go home. He said if he got killed, his father would have a hero for his son, and he could spend all his time and money building monuments to him and make himself very happy and proud. But if he lives through it and goes home, he says his father will fight with him for the rest of his life. No matter what he does, his father will say it's wrong and worry over it. All I want to do is sit on the porch of San Susi and whittle the rest of my life. Don't forget me, kids. Please. And go to Grider. And sometimes when you're up there, try to remember how we used to ride on the hay wagons. Goodbye, kids. June 14th. Move to a new aerodrome at St. Omer. They're expecting a big battle down here. My new motor is a dud. It chewed up a valve, but I got back to the drome all right. My dog has fleas. The young aviator lay dying. And as in the hangar he lay, to the mechanics who around him were standing, these last parting words he did say. Two valve springs you'll find in my stomach. Three spark plugs safe in my lung. The prop is in splinters inside me. To my fingers, the joystick has clung. Take the cylinders out of my kidneys, the connecting rod out of my brain. From the small of my back, take the camshaft and assemble the engine again. March 30th, 1918. I went to a big dance and managed to collect a redhead. She gave every indication of being ready to burn my fingers, so I left while the door was still open. She sure is a good looking woman. But my grandfather told me never to get mixed up with a redheaded woman who wears black underwear. Dear diary, I think I'm going crazy. I keep watching the clock and figuring how long I have to live. Sometimes I think I'm getting the same disease that Springs has when I get sick at my stomach. When I go out to get in my plane, my feet are like lead. I'm just barely able to drag them after me. But as soon as I take off, I'm all right again. War is a horrible thing. A grotesque comedy. And it is so useless. This war won't prove anything. All we'll do when we win is to substitute one sort of dictator for another. In the meantime, we have destroyed our best resources. Human life the most precious thing in the world has become the cheapest. Even those who survive it will never be good for anything else.